Hi everyone, it is Friday and this is the Parent Exchange here at Parent Support for Online Learning. My name is Tilly Elvram and I am your host today and an administrator here on, uh, in the group. And today we're, I'm excited because I'm here with somebody who is uh, probably more passionate about online education and innovation uh, than me and she's been doing this work a very long time supporting families in their their online journeys and education and uh, I'm just really excited to get started today to talk about uh, everything that's happening in the world of education and it seems like it's changing by the minute lately and uh, there's a lot of politics involved with it and changes and it's hard to keep up but i'm excited to have an expert here to guide us through it and, and just kind of dig into the issues facing families and educators and the system in general uh, so today we have amy valentine here with us she is the ceo of future of school and uh amy i'll, I'll turn it over to you tell us uh, what Future of School is doing and uh, what's on your mind right now with uh, just this whole whole COVID-19 crisis learning that we've been going through. Absolutely. Thank you, Tilly, so much for having me. Uh, we go, we've known each other for a long time, and I think it's really important to have people who are advocating for parents and kids and teachers as well and so it's been an honor to work with you and anytime i have the chance to talk to you about hot topics issues and most importantly solutions to the challenges that we're facing i am all in so i um just honored to be here and share with you the work of future of school and then also some perspective on where we are in our country right now with education and perhaps most importantly answer questions that folks that are here have and to be a resource for folks who are watching the recorded link to reach out after the fact. So absolutely. I'll give you a, just a brief overview of future school until you feel free to chime in with any questions, even if they're related to the current issues to date and not necessarily to the work. Um, we are the leading public charity that's focused on um, broadcasting the impact that technology and innovation has on the lives of teachers, students, families, and society as a whole in our country. So a couple of people have asked kind of jokingly, oh, did, did you just start in March of 2020? To which I say, no, actually, we are going into our fifth year of existence. We've been around for five years. We've known for a long time that there's change that's needed in our K-12 schools. We've known that. Um, and we've been waiting for people to see that that education is the only vertical in our society that hasn't been catalyzed by technology. And fast forward to where we are now, here we are today. So um, we, our programs have been um, the same since we launched. We are doing some, some pivoting um, right now to be able to be a bigger, larger service. Um, so I'll just kind of share with you, these are our initiatives. We are a nonprofit. We give scholarships to students who graduate from high school having taken uh, some online and blended courses, who really um, speak to the impact it had on their lives. And interestingly, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, these kids come from all school types, from all over the country, from all different types of circumstances and situations. And they're so amazing when they talk about what their experiences with online and blended programs and classes did for them and it had on their lives. We also give grants to teachers who are innovating in the classroom. One could say that that's probably every teacher right now. So, um, you know, we have more on our website about our programs, but again, we, we've always believed that if we can elevate the student voice, if we can empower teachers to transform their classrooms, and if we can publish some research to be of influence of, over people as a whole and give them some information, that we would be far better off than not making this available to people. So, um, so our programs are, are the same as they were. We've just added to what we've done. We created a remote learning relief fund to provide some immediate money for teachers and schools. We give out teacher of the week awards in the, in the form of a, of a small monetary acknowledgement to teachers who are really demonstrating their ability to ebb and flow with the times. 
we started a Facebook stories page where people can learn and share together and a teacher triage. So we have pivoted a little bit and responded to the current um, times of where we are. And one of the other things that's important too is that we take our knowledge of what's been done since the first online school launched in the mid 1990s and that we provide some information to our country as a whole because this is new. This is new territory. So the fact that there's been people that have been supporting it, they've seen the benefits, they know the advantages, that's great. But I think it's also really important to acknowledge that online education isn't new to America. And I put this on the slide. Instead, it's new to most Americans. Um, because what happened with the pandemic hitting was a mass onset of crisis schooling or emergency schooling, not, not schooling online or not online schooling. They were doing their work through a computer, but that's very different from online education. So we really um, want to be of service and want to help support and grow our nonprofit future of school. And I believe that this, there's never been a time that we'll be able to do that. And that's why these forums, like the Parent Online Exchange, is so important to share resources and give people a place to ask questions, learn, and arguably most importantly, to stop and really consider and think about why they think what they think about education and, and maybe to have some of those assumptions um, challenged and, and to maybe reconsider that. Well, I, I love all of that. And I just want to hit on, uh, yeah, you, this organization didn't just crop up because, oh, we see a crisis and we want to capitalize on it. You guys have been doing really important work. And as a parent, I was so grateful because it really, for the first time, I saw an organization recognize our students for the amazing scholars that they are and the, the unique positions that they've been in as online learners. And, you know, they really, for a long time, online education has been an afterthought. And you guys really kind of elevated them. And I see Jason there on the screen, um, an amazing student with an amazing story. And go to Future of School Stories, go to Amy's page. I dare you to watch the videos of these kids and not cry your eyes out because they're such amazing students who have overcome so many challenges and um, online learning was there for them, whether it was a full-time online program or course access or a blended program, it really helped them reach their full potential. And so um, just gratitude as a parent for the work that you've done and the scholarships. I, how much money have you guys, um, you know, given out in scholarships at this point to students? <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> um, to date, we've given away just under $2 million in student scholarships. And the reason why this is such a, a critical component to what we do is because we've, know, we've known that having access to different quality options can be the, it's, it's the make or break point for students. That's why having, you know, that's why zip code should never determine the access that you have to a quality school because having options is really, that's what aligns students with their passion for learning. And so our scholarship program, it's, it's been amazing to watch because we, when we set forth, we said, we want to give scholarships to kids who have basically that they can talk about how the online and blended courses in any setting, brick and mortar, homeschool, full-time online, we're agnostic, but that they say, this kept me engaged in school. This gave me access to classes that I otherwise wouldn't have had access to. This allowed me to, you know, be able to be in school when I had a severe medical issue. And so the stories that they share are so different, but the common thread across all of them is that it afforded them an opportunity that they otherwise wouldn't have had because of the limitations. So last summer, we um, sat down and we watched all of the videos, all of the 133 videos, we watched them. 
and we created categories. Okay, what is each, why are these students choosing these options? They wanted access to advanced classes. They were struggling and they needed different types of classes. They had a passion pursuit they wanted to follow. They wanted to earn college credit. And we came up with 47 reasons and we had to narrow that down from many more than that. And so, you know, related to COVID-19, we, this is so important that people that are unsure, they don't know two things. First of all, that they, when people are talking about, okay, our district's moving to online school, we're moving to virtual education. I would just really encourage people to think about the fact that what's happening, what happened this spring was crisis schooling. And that it's my hope that schools and districts will be able to move to effective remote instruction. But those two terms are very different from online. Online schools, they have to, in order to be public schools, they have to be compliant with state and federal regulations, which means they have to prove and demonstrate capacity to serve all students. They, all of the different components, they, you know, they're using the state funding to provide more options for kids, that their curriculum is aligned. So there is a big difference there. Well, let's, let's dig into that because I know you and I at, you know, what was it like March 12th or 13th, uh, just, you know, the world shut down and all of a sudden everybody was a remote learner. And I know I was just uh, like, I was sitting there watching what was happening and so frustrated because I knew kids were getting shortchanged, educators were not, you know, in the best position and, and it wasn't necessarily anybody's fault, but, you know, for years we've been saying, guys, it's a whole new world and what are we doing to prepare you know, for, for 21st century learning and so many were caught on their heels. And so um, it, it was just heartbreaking to watch this crisis learning. And, and I think you've been very intentional about making the distinction between what was happening, um, you know, in March, April, May, how it was different than what my family chose and a lot of parents in this group uh, have chosen. Um, you know, I was looking at the Census Bureau statistics for like the last week of April or May. So it not even, not even March 13th or the, you know, the third week of March or whatever, when people were just trying to, you know, catch their breath and figure it out. They had already, you know, we were weeks into this and on average, students had 4.1 hours of virtual instruction in America. That's a problem. And, you know, I don't, do you have concerns? What have, what have you been hearing from teachers as they, you know, they've done the crisis remote and we're hoping for better going into the fall, but what what were you hearing from teachers during the crisis and has it evolved? Are we feeling better and in a better position going into the fall? Um, what do you think about that? Okay, so did you say we have three hours or seven hours left Four? of our- <laughs> uh, Yeah, right, yes, yes. Uh, and I took, when I was promoting this, I'm like, you guys, this is gonna be like a wide ranging, fast moving conversation because there is so much um, but you have spent a lot of time talking with educators. Um, if you're not on Twitter and you're not following Amy and Future of School, you should, especially if you're interested in the, that teacher piece, because every week she's having these great webinars with educators and then Twitter chats where you can really, you get the mood, you get the feel of the room. Um, by these conversations that yeah. that future of school is doing, so I I don't know. Give us like yes. the the COVID crisis, <laughs> wh where they were at, and you know I think we all thought, and I think a lot of parents we thought, okay, we hear they're getting all this money, this federal stimulus that's supposed to bolster uh, and and help out our schools. 
And we thought, okay, this money's gonna go into remote learning, getting ready, because I don't know, I could see that cases were going up and the prospects from for fall probably weren't great. Um, but are they ready? Like, yeah. take us back and then where are we now? Okay, I'm gonna take us back a little bit longer and make one comment and then fast forward about 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm so lucky and fortunate, Tilly, that I have had the opportunity to teach in the classroom and to teach online. Yeah. And to have had those experiences. And when I taught in the classroom, um, I didn't teach an easy subject. I taught foreign language to high school students. So either way, however you want to shape it up, in person, online, it's an elective, it's challenging. You know, some students struggle with, you know, their native language. And so it's, you know, I was very lucky and I was very fortunate to teach in an urban, a rural and a suburban school. So I, so my heart is as an educator, I understand what that role is like. I've seen it transform through the years which is why at Future of School, giving grants to teachers to innovate is something that is a top priority for us. So I just wanna share that for all the educators watching this, that there are people out there and for all the parents out there, Tilly, you know, you have people out there that, under, that can understand, maybe not exactly, but they can relate to where you are. And that's why we do what we do. And so, and I'll just speak for Tilly. I'll speak for my friend Tilly that, that that's the case. Um, but yes, the educator perspective, I actually, I'll pull up um, from our webinar and thank you for sharing that. Can you see my slide of my? I can see it. Okay. So essentially, if, if people want to know where were we before COVID-19 from a teacher perspective, um, we can look at this PricewaterhouseCoopers national survey that was done in the fall of 2018 that gives you some highlights. It was an analysis of teachers. Tell us what you need. Tell us how you feel it's going but specifically around technology. And so this is very telling because when we look at this, 10% of the representative survey of the K-12 teachers, that's the 10% of them felt confident incorporating higher level technology. That's not technology. I mean, 5% of those, you know, could say, could, it's very discretionary, you know, their definition of higher level technology. Maybe for one teacher, that means, um, using the smart board and one, you know, one-to-one -one tablets. Maybe for another teacher, that's broadcasting a video from YouTube onto, you know, onto a screen. So there's some variability here, but what we see is that the minority of teachers felt comfortable incorporating higher level technology. But if you look down at the third bullet, 79, almost, you know, the majority of the teachers, 79% said that they wanted more professional development. They wanted training. They want to do it, but they didn't feel confident because they didn't have the training. And then when we look to see who had access to devices at home, who had broadband access, that those are other barriers that stood in the way that were identified as we want to, but we, we can't, right? We, are not, we don't have training, we don't have the resources. And so what the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey did was it made you know, this, this uh, correlation between the preparedness of teachers and comfortability, which is not teacher's fault, right, to their ability to reshape how teaching and learning happens from a one teacher in front of the classroom providing that direct instruction where the student receives and the teacher gives. And they said, the reason why we don't, we are having a hard time with a ready workforce is because teachers don't have what they need to prepare kids for higher level tech skills. So um, I found this not after COVID, I was looking for some comparative um, information because of the fact that we, Future of School, we did our own survey. We, we sent a survey out right after most schools had let out, so the middle to end of June. And we didn't see the PricewaterhouseCoopers survey until after the results came back. So that was kind of a post comparison. And I'm happy to make these slides available to anyone who's watching. There's a ton of information to dig into. But when you look at some of those comparative pieces, the majority, overwhelming majority of teachers were not trained. They weren't trained to use the technology. They weren't trained in what online instruction is. Te teaching online, it's very different from, from teaching in a traditional brick and mortar environment. It's, and, and so we hit this rub in the spring where remote learning or crisis schooling, you know, 
scanning an, a worksheet and emailing it to a student, it, it wasn't effective because yeah. the pedagogy behind it is different. And it's not to say that a teacher has to train for four years to be an effective online teacher, but the intentionality of it is something that's really important. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, that's what I've been stressing to folks is that it's, my fear is, is the difference between March and September is going to be that maybe our teachers are better at operating Zoom or WebEx or Google Meet, um, but they won't have received the pedagogy or, you know, the, it's not enough to just digitize your, your curriculum. It's yes. got to be more intentional. And that's my fear is that we're not ready. Well, and it's, uh, okay, I, I, I will, I don't think we're ready. And I'll share with you my, my rationale for that in a second. When we look at this comparison, the, the minority of teachers received training, but the majority of them had to use it. And so that, I mean, when we look at what the challenges are, what the teachers identified, what the challenges are, they were big. They were really big challenges. And, um, you know, you have students that weren't trained and families that were, everyone was thrust into this very um, unexpected situation. And I, you know me, Tilly, I'm not a glasses half full, I'm a glasses overflowing. I like to believe that people did the best that they could. I believe in, I believe that, I really do. But when, what we're looking at is such a disruption to the traditional system that it was, it almost reminds me of like, uh, like an iceberg or like tectonic plates coming up together because it, there, it was so big and so much. And so, um, like I said, we have tons of quotes in here and things like that, and I'm happy to share it. Um, but the, the reason why I, you know, my concern for the fall is I have seen, I've talked to a lot of districts, a lot of parents and teachers and leaders and there, you know, it was like, let's make it through the end of the year. Let's make it through crisis schooling. Let's make it through the end of the year. And I think in the back of people's minds and in some open discussions too, it was because then we can go back to how it was like then, then this pandemic will be gone. We can go back to what it was. And then, so part of the waiting, part of the waiting was because of budget. People were waiting for budgets. Then the waiting became, okay, let's see the state of our, of our state or the state of our community which I totally respect and understand because why would a school go down the road of creating a, you know, a, an, an online learning environment if their true belief was that they, you know, and feeling was that they were going to bring all the kids back. And so it was waiting, waiting, waiting. And at the same time, we saw the implications that schools, you know, might have to go part remote. They might have to go hybrid. They might, we're trying to figure it out and the days pass. And we wait, and now here we are a few weeks, in some cases a week, in other cases a few weeks before school starts. And so I, I don't think that they're still figuring out the model. They're still figuring out how to accommodate the students. So any professional development or training for teachers done up to this point, unless it was just strictly tech training, would, would have been putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, not a great place to be at this point. And I, and I promised we wouldn't get too political, but there are, it's turned, re, school reopenings have turned into this political battleground. And I think, you know, just everybody is in this untenable position. And so you've got the politics and certain people really want schools open. And then you've got, like you said, the realities on the ground, the virus is really deciding whether schools are going to reopen or not. And, you know, where it might be safe in one community, it is not safe in another. And there's, there seems to be this disconnect between um, maybe what policymakers want and the actual feeling, mood, trust in the system from parents and educators who are saying, you know, we, we don't feel safe sending our kids back, or we don't feel safe sending our, you know, our older teachers into a classroom because they're in at-risk categories. And so there's that disconnect. And 
I think it's really clouded our judgment and how we've approached school reopenings. Um, and it changes every day. It's, you know, I, I just know school districts here in college, like we thought, okay, we're gonna have a hybrid mix. And then pretty soon it was like, no, it's either or. Either you come in person or you're 100% online. And yeah. that puts parents in like just a crazy um, position to be in. Um, but I mean, I know you've also been talking to educators and what kind of professional development have you been hearing what are they getting? Are schools, are schools leaning into our experienced, you know, full-time online providers and, and those, you know, uh, vendors that really specialize in hybrid learning? Are you hearing about that? Are we getting enough of, you know, leaning on their expertise? Um, yeah, I will say that I, I have heard from different, you know, from different leaders, they're exploring this company and they're exploring that curriculum and they're exploring that. What I will tell you, though, there's some trepidation around it, more. I hear more trepidation about that than I do. We're working with this company or we're partnering with that company around this in when the pandemic hit, the space became so clouded with people we have math intervention. We offer, um, you know, ELA content online. We offer this, we offer that. But when we're talking about the majority of schools in the system have operated much the same that they have since the first school in the 1600s, even it was a lot. There was, it was like this uh, saturation and it was hard to tell who to go to for what and what was going to be a long-term solution versus a short-term solution. So I believe that there is a great opportunity for the private sector to come together to be, a, you know, a, a group of, okay, we, we have been around, right? We've been around for 20 plus years. We have a, you know, a, a stellar reputation, you know, have these different components and then say, and, you know, we want, we're, we really want to help support and we can cut, help you cut through the noise. I think there's an opportunity there, but I don't think it will be something that will happen before school starts. No, so the professional time is short. Yeah. So the professional development piece, I think it's, this is, this is the year of customized professional development. This is the year where the professional development in order to be effective, will have to ha do a couple things. One to be truly effective. It's going to have to involve a variety of stakeholders in terms of the design. And, and some schools have been doing amazing with professional development, even in the traditional, you know, in the traditional setting, not using technology. They have PLCs, they have PLMs. I, my Twitter network is the most random network of amazing educators from all across the country and parts of the world. And I, I love that, that that technology has been able to bring people together and they share through those mediums too. So I think professional development is going to have to involve multiple stakeholders. It's going to have to be nimble and flexible. But the, at the core of it, it's the decisions about what is our model have to come before that training comes, because otherwise it's going to be too much for the teachers. I mean, of course, if a school wants to say, okay, yes, we're going to, we're going to have a Zoom training or we're going to have, you can do some things ahead of time to get ready for any learning environment. But the real, true alignment of this is our model, this is the schedule, you know, that has to that has to be preceded by those major decisions. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I don't. Would you say the future of school is hybrid models? Would I that, think would that put us in a better position for the next COVID or hurricane or major snowstorm i you know things have schools face crisis and i and i have always said that you know online learning has has always been crisis learning because so many of our students our schools are there for students in crisis many times mm -hmm. and so that's what lent them uh to do what they do so well is because that's what they were developed for to to be there for a kid who was homebound because of illness or homeless or you know whatever their situation was um 
but I don't know, what is the future of school? Well, I will say that how you framed crisis, we've talked about that, at, you know, especially when we look at our scholarship winners, because it's been, you know, it's not the time for a future of school to say, we have proof of concept. It works. That time is coming. But this is, you know, I think it's important to recognize that this was a very difficult time socially and collectively for people. There was so much fear around the not knowing. Yeah. Who does it affect? How serious is it? How do you get it? And so, you know, touting the benefits, not that it would have been inappropriate, but there's a time and a place and the time and the place is coming now that we know what we know. But I've said the same thing. Our, you know, Online and blended learning has helped students really transform personal crises. And what I've even expanded my definition of crisis to be a life-changing event. Maybe that life-changing event was they exhausted all the AP classes and they were at a crisis of not being engaged. Or maybe the crisis for them was figuring out a learning environment that, that would work for them so they could work part-time and help contribute to their family. I think when we hear the word crisis, it evokes this negative, it has negative connotation with it. But again, I told you, I'm the glasses half full. So I'm like, a crisis can be a pivotal point by which we do, it motivates us to do something different. So I would also encourage people that are watching and listening to, to think about that as well, because learning happens anywhere. It happens anytime. And crisis schooling took the four walls in the building of a school and it broke it down. And it demonstrated to everybody that if your child, when they finish their school or whatever, if they want to go in the kitchen and go and get a recipe from the cooking channel and because their passion is cooking and they're cultivating those skills, that's amazing. And that's great. So um, the, I love what you said about the, you know, individual personal crisis and how online and blended learning meets that. And I just, I would just add to that, that it's, it can be positive too, even though I think in, you know, generally we think of it as a negative. Um, and then the future of school, I mean, I, I think the future of school can, you know, can be summarized in schools that are resilient, schools that have the components that will allow them to meet the needs of students and help prepare kids for the workforce and to help prepare them for what they want to do in a way that we don't really hear anymore. I don't like school. I, you know, oh, PE, you know, PE and all due respect to PE, PE and lunch are my favorite classes. It's like, if we look to things like project-based learning and we look at how technology can have adaptive experiences for kids, that it's the resilient schools are gonna be the ones that thrive. And I think this coming year, we're gonna be able to identify some of the markers of resilient schools because we're building the train as we're building the tracks and we have a lot to learn from online and blended programs because we, our scholarship winners this year, three of them said, the only aspect of my life that didn't change through the pandemic was my schooling. You don't hear that story. You don't hear kids saying, well, I was just fine. Like I got to spend more time with my family because my school, I went to a, you know, a district run online program or I went to a full-time online school that was fine. So it actually, I didn't have a learning curve there. So I think it's a, it's resilient schools. And I also think it's empowered people. It's parents being empowered that they have options with where their kids go to school. We live in a day and time, especially right now, right now with social justice being such a focus, equality and equity and access. And those are, those are things that our K-12 education system, it, it, it doesn't embody that just by, the, just by the sheer nature of the structure of it, right? And where we are today. So that's being looked at. All of the components are being looked at. So I, I think at this point, it really is about how schools are able to transform will be what the future of school is. Yeah, I really think that, you know, as much as I get aggravated and frustrated because I see families in real pain like you know they're trying to figure out how am I going to do remote learning and work from home or go out into the workforce and, and do my job and manage my student and make sure that education continues so you know I get frustrated but I also see this amazing opportunity you know 
for us, we've been talking about online education and so excited about it. And sometimes we were the only ones in the room that were excited about it. And, and that was lonely work. Um, now to see so many thinking about the, the possibilities of what technology and innovation can do for our kids, it's really exciting. And so we have, this is an opportunity we shouldn't miss and we shouldn't, I, I hope we don't long to go back to all of the normal because that wasn't necessarily serving everybody well. And, you know, and then on that other piece, you got me thinking about the equity and access. When we talk about the technology and the Wi Fi access for families at, that we're doing without, and, it, you know, I made my first trip to DC to talk about broadband internet issues like a decade ago and walked the halls of Capitol Hill and was basically told like, yeah, we know that's important, but it's really not a priority. It's a priority now. And I hope that this crisis is going to be the catalyst to, to get some, some real things done to get you know, more technology into every household. There's, you know, at this point, every student should be able to do their homework at home and not in the car, in the parking lot of some place that has yeah. Wi-Fi or be work trying to do a paper on their phone, those kinds of things. So I hope those conversations are going to happen and, and be fruitful now and that it, you know, maybe the political will will be there to make some of these um, things happen that that have been Im important to not just online families but to all all families um, have um, you heard initiatives on on that piece i mean i certainly have heard of of different you know companies and organizations working to help solve for those problems you know when the pandemic hit cell phone companies they said okay we're going to give um you know, hotspot access for 60 days to families so that they can use their phones as hotspots. Google, I was on a panel last week where um, one of the directors from, of external affairs from Google was talking about their initiatives to put um, Wi-Fi routers on the backs of school buses. But to your point, I mean, we know, and we know that Education Superhighway did an amazing job with support from, from E-Rate. Yeah. And ensuring that every school had uh, the, you know, baseline level of high-speed internet access in the country. If, yeah. if So when I think about making that available to all families in all areas, I think it's a big challenge, but I think it's one that absolutely can be solved for. It's a matter of prior, prioritization and funding to make that happen. And yeah. I think that one of the challenges is education has long been a third rail political issue and it's not uh you know it doesn't have a corporate structure it's not okay we're gonna you know invest this much and we're gonna get this much out of it but what our con you know what as just as a society we don't see that children are the best investment you know that's the best investment we can make education and so i think as far as access and equity goes there, there isn't going to be turning back, especially when we look at some of the marginalized groups that have suffered from the inequities and the inequalities. Um, you know, I was at a, a webinar yesterday and I was sharing the Washington Post report that came out, that came out last year um, that white school districts received more than $23 billion than non-white school districts in state and local funding. And this was from 2016 and they had the same number of students. So I think, I think when the pandemic, I know when the pandemic hit, what we saw happen in very short order was the policies that have held back a lot of these things, accountability frameworks and standardized testing, state testing, um, you know, those seat time, kids have to have their, their rears in seats for X amount of days a year. Those in, in the face of danger, those policies were flipped off and on in a matter of, in some days, in like, in some situations, in minutes. It was remarkable, right? <laughs> so now we have this, if we know what's possible, we know what's possible. 
Yeah. I think it's going to, it, it's going to take parents saying my, you know, zip code shouldn't determine quality access. It's, and, and I think there's a really great opportunity for the online providers, all of them, all of them to say, hey, we've been doing this and here's what we've learned. And we're, you know, here's a couple of resources. You know, we can help you. We offer this curriculum. I think there's a great opportunity for partnership because I, I've never, I believe that there's enough room in the space for, for everybody. I mean, when you look at the full-time enrollments in our country, it's, it's like, I, I think the last I checked, it was less than 1% of the 56.6 million students in our yeah. country. It's yeah. less than 1%. We're, what, what I'm advocating for is options for kids for the best learning environment for them. And I, I'd be really interested to see how many families whose kids, even if it wasn't perfect, even if it had challenges with it, how many of their kids really in, enjoyed the schooling from home well, we, in the remote we, environment? We saw studies, um, you know, where they, parents said, like, we knew our kids, a majority of parents said, we knew our kids didn't learn as much during this time, but we really kind of liked it. We liked the remote learning that our school offered, even if it wasn't as robust. Um, maybe they didn't learn as much as they, they would have if they would have been in person the whole time, but they, they saw the benefits of it. And we hear from families, you know, life just kind of slowed down. They weren't up till 10 o'clock after baseball practice doing homework, you know, stress levels went down, bullying incidents went down. Uh, you know, those kinds of things, things that parents really matter, the health, safety, and happiness of their children um, really look different in, in that environment. And so there were definite benefits there. And there, you know, in what is it, North Carolina, they had 22,000 applications for 5,000 seats in mm. their virtual schools. And because we have caps, there's a big chunk of families that are now, you know, they're not going to be able to exercise school choice and to enroll in a full-time online. And they're going to have to go and do the remote learning that's offered through their districts. And that's why it's been so, I've implored our, our school leaders, state leaders, please lean on these folks that know how to do it. As you said, two decades. We've been doing this work for two decades and this is their specialty and this is, they know how to do it and they want to be there. They want to offer help. Um, you know, I, I look at reopening task force, um, all over the country. I'm not seeing a lot of specialized online representation, um, in those task force and it's really disappointing and it's a missed opportunity. Um, but we'll just keep plugging away and, you know, hoping that, that they will get a seat at the table because I think it's really important. And I also think it's important that folks realize that yes, we had continuity in education, but that doesn't mean that our families weren't feeling the repercussions from this virus. Our yeah. families lost jobs. And because our families do online learning at home, doesn't mean that they live in isolation. They're out in their communities. Our kids are active in, you know, in scouting and they go to the Y and they play sports and they're musicians and they do volunteer. They lost all those opportunities as well. And so I, you know, and, you know, we're, like you said, we're public schools. We have, there's implications when statewide testing, when they applied for those waivers and it shut down. Like we had concerns over that too, and we're not in the conversation. And yeah. so um, I guess there's ample opportunity. There's so many ways where, um, you know, we should be tapping into uh, organizations like yours and, and then the families that have been doing full-time online for, you know, decades now, um, we need to be listening to them because they can inform and, and educate, but they can also 
talk about the unique challenges that our families and our educators face as well. You know, they're learning from home, they're teaching from home as well. Um, yeah. So um, it's just, yeah. it's opportunity. I mean, I think it absolutely is. And I'd love to go back to a comment you made about the caps, right? That there are certain limits in states in terms of the number of students that can enroll. And, you know, my understanding is sometimes there's a rational, you know, there's a rationale as to why, but in many cases, it's more arbitrary. It's more, we, you know, we want to have a limit on the number of students for a variety of reasons, you know, that can go to the full-time online. Because, you know, I was thinking about that too, that um, earlier today that, you know, as a statewide public charter school or program of the district, you could enroll, you could theoretically enroll every single student, right? And that would be a major disruption. Do I think that's, that, that's never been something that I think that would happen, but I, I can, that's how you level the playing field. That's, how, that's why online schools, technology doesn't judge. Technology doesn't, you know, it doesn't handpick students. Technology is a vehicle and a mechanism by which you can equalize and level the playing field. So I was, when you said that about the caps, I, I had this image in my mind of, you know, that day at the Capitol in Denver where cyber school families come and they show their support. Imagine if there was 40,000 families who said, this isn't working. Yeah. And we know there's a cap. So remove the cap. Like we're, this, there's never been a time I, that I, of my lifetime at least where people can come together for that positive change that needs to happen we see it happening with teachers unions saying no our te we want our teachers to work remotely we're not going to jeopardize their health and you're like wow okay that's a, that's a major departure right yeah. Yeah. you hear you hear people saying we're not going to be a marginalized group anymore we we demand equality so i feel like and you're the expert in parents so I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I feel like teachers and parents, their collective voices have gone way too long quiet, quieter than they would have to be in order to demand change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're, I think we're seeing just uh, how powerful those voices are uh, because, you know, like I said, I don't want to get political, but there are folks that really want to see schools reopen and and I'm sensitive to that of all the reasons why that you know a lot of kids that's where they thrive it, that in person piece and it's important to to families because it's a part of their their child care structure uh you know it's part nutrition programs for families um, you know, and, and we want, we want to get people back to work and educators, they, they want to be with their, their mm. students and I'm sensitive to all of that. But, you know, I think parents aren't going to do what they're not comfortable doing. And so they're not going to send their kids. And, and we've seen that across socioeconomic. It is not just wealthy parents, um, saying, you know, I'm not going to send my kid to school. Latino, Black families all across the country have said, we're not comfortable. And, you know, they're making their voices heard, I think, every day. And I encourage them to continue to do that um, so that the, the market responds, the policymakers take notice. And, and try to get to the root issues of why is that? You know, what's yeah. going on that they don't have the trust in the system um, and are comfortable to go back? So, yeah. um, I, and, and I have never, I, you know, I, I love, I'm a lifelong learner. I love taking grad classes. You know, theory of change was one of my favorite, you know, diffusion of innovations. So I'm fascinated by change. I'm, I am the, um, person in my family who's okay taking, you know, making changes and doing things different and mixing it up. And I am fascinated, but I don't know that I've ever seen any other institution or entity that has been more resistant to change than the K-12 education system. And, 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 and that's not a judgment call. It's just, it has stayed so much the same. And I recognize innovation has come in pockets, 
but this is like a call to action for true transformation to do at the end of the day what is in our kids best interest and i i always go back to that you know when i'm in webinars i show pictures of kids i show stories of teachers it's easy to get away from that especially since you know education can be such a personal thing i mean how many times have you heard someone say well, when I was young, I went to school, I walked uphill both ways and borrowed my brother's shoes and I turned out just fine. These kids yeah. are going to be just fine. I don't doubt that they're not going to be just fine, but don't we want to set them up for as much success as possible? Yeah. Yeah. It's kids are resilient and you know, they'll, they'll, and parents will make a way though. Also parents are incredible when it comes to getting their kids what they need. And I, I that you know, that's another part of the conversation. You know, now they're talking about um, micro schools, and this week the hot topic is pods, learning pods, where parents are going to hire a teacher or somebody to oversee a small group of kids. And um, you know, there's one group that's like, yes, that's all about choice. And then there's another group that's like, well, that's just going to make, you know, things more inequitable because not everybody can do it. And my first impression was, here's these outside, whether it's the media or policy people or establishment folks, basically pitting parents against each other. And they're having a turf war. And I'm like, enough of that. <laughs> yeah, like, let's not do that to parents. Let's not turn parents into villains in yeah. in this whole conversation because parents are just trying to do what's best for their kids and we can't fault them for that we they're doing the best that they can in the situation that they're in and you know sometimes it's like a double-edged sword because we get you know like it's your fault that you care so much about your kid and you want to make sure that they're not slipping through the cracks and that, you know, they reach their full potential. I'm like, how can you fault a, a parent for, for doing that? Um, and then yes, let's get parents, every parent, the resources to do whatever that looks like. Um, you know, why are we arguing about this and, you know, pitting parent against parent? It doesn't make sense. And, you know, I just, Oh, just kind of, it's been interesting to watch and uh, the politics of it has given me whiplash to <laughs> see the, the different power players kind of switch positions on online learning and wh who's in favor of it now who, you know, six months ago, it wasn't going to happen. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's been it, interesting and um, I hope that I hope that you will continue to, um, you know, just be out there and, and pushing for the innovation and highlighting all the good that can happen when we embrace innovation in our schools, no matter what model it looks like, because I appreciate all that you do and the insights that you bring to the conversation because of your experience. Um, any last, I don't like you, you're the glasses full lady. So any words of wisdom to leave our, our parents and our, the educators <laughs> in this group with? No pressure there. Right. I mean, I, I will say this. Thank you for calling me an expert. I, if I'm an expert at anything, it's seeking out information. I am, I mean, I have curiosity about a lot. And so I would encourage people to have a curious mind when it comes to what this year looks like. I know, I, you know, I'm a parent and I'm a parent of a student who's at, you know, who was at, is on a 504 at school. And this past spring, it was not, a, it wasn't addressed. And, and that's okay, right? If everyone's doing the best that they can and they care and they're doing everything within their means to help kids, then having some grace and giving some, cutting some slack, I think, as, and it's not to, to, to diminish the importance of it. It's just, it's, it was different then than what I, my expectation is moving forward, right? We're out of the crisis. Move, you know, I believe we should be moving from crisis schooling to effective remote instruction, if that's part of what a school or a district or a state is going to offer. So I think having some grace for what happened, you know, this spring, and then also, Every, like you said, everything's changing daily. 
I would encourage teachers to never stop dreaming about what the best classroom for their kids can be, regardless of what kind of environment it's in, if it's virtual, if it's in person, if it's hybrid, that the connect, the impact that teachers have on the lives of students has never before ever been as visible or as important as we saw it in the spring. And I hope we collectively hold on to that. Um, and that with the transformation of schools is going to come the transformation of what their job is. And I believe that's going to be, be better. It's going to give them the opportunity to be in that position of power. Um, to parents, I, you know, I would say at any point of the year, you, you know, you can, I, I don't want to say that you can change, you, you can change because there are some areas where there are, they, their choice is limited, yeah. where people are restricted. So I, it would be my hope that out of this comes choice for all parents and that they have quality options for how their student learns the best. That's what my hope would be. But in the meantime, I think there's a, you know, there's a great opportunity that parents have now that they've seen how their kids learn and they've seen them in action. They have a better understanding of how their brain works, you know, for the good, the bad and the hard and the frustrating and all of it that, um, you know, to stay in a place of curiosity about what other learning environments might work for them. And for students, it really is, I mean, this ne they've never been in a situation, you know, our kids, us as adults, it's a really interesting time. And what's going to come out of this is a, a, a new iteration of teaching and learning that we couldn't have imagined before that all the pioneers of online and blended learning that have been doing it, that they have a great, they have the potential to really lead the charge in this so that you know, traditional schools can catch up with the times and do things differently, even moderately differently or slightly differently to be able to serve kids better. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Amy Valentine, CEO of Future of School. We're so grateful that you could spend some time with us and share all your expertise. Uh, I know uh, there was a lot of comments, just people kind of really just like, yes, yes. <laughs> in agreement with you. Um, and we will post links uh, to, and Lori Cooney actually posted a lot of links to Future of School to share with our parents so that they can go and reach out to you. And I know there's already, you've got a couple new Twitter followers as well. So Excellent. Uh, thank you, Amy. Please follow her on Twitter, follow Future of School. They're doing amazing work to support um, online innovation, hybrid learning, educators, they really are uh, covering a lot of ground mm -hmm. and working with families and, and educators in a really important way. So make sure, show them some love on Twitter and, and follow them and support them in their work because it, it's meaningful and it's meant a lot to my family. I know that for sure. So thank you all for being here. Uh, next week, our guest, uh, is a really cool innovator who's come up with a new app that mixes two of my favorite things, music and education. And so mm -hmm. I'm excited to talk about that next week on the front, uh, Parent Exchange. So thank you all. Have a great thank you. day. Stay healthy, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.